Hey everyone, welcome back to another live stream recording of the Engadget Podcast. I'm Senior Editor Devendra Hardwar. Today I'm joined with our Deputy Day Editor, Nate Ingram. Hey Nate, how's it going? Hey, hey Devendra, what's going on this week? Oh, uh, so much. Well, actually, yeah. not, not too much, so we're going to focus on something fun here. Also, our yep. podcast producer, Ben Elman, is here. Hey, Ben. Coming to you live from a brand new M1 Pro MacBook. Oh, bah, man. Bah, 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 bah. A, a journey that has taken several months, so Ben has gotten the... his new computer. Did you get the 14 inch or the 16 inch? 16 inch, I figured. 32 gig RAM. I had to wait for the big 32 boy. gig RAM. The That's like, yeah, the big boy. It's it was 16 gigs was available in stores. 32 gigs was uh, mm -hmm. something that you had to order, and because of the lockdown <laughs> in, in Shanghai, I was waiting from March until just earlier this week. Man, our. Man. Uh, and gadget contributors swapped a Krishna bought a Mac Studio and the monitor like in March and she's still waiting for both of them. Maybe it was April, but it's wait, the forever. actual like Mac Rough. studio monitor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That everyone but, hates. But yeah, but why though? I, I'm not gonna for, try and tell for, for folks who just want a pretty, you know, good looking monitor, it's fine. I want to say hello to everybody in the chat room. I'm seeing Daniel Diaz, Elemento, Buddy305 Love. Hello, everybody. Mark B. Uh, we did not do an episode last week, or at least not a live stream oh. episode, so I missed you all. We just did an audio only because our uh, video producer, Julio, was on vacation. So Oh, good for Julio. We needed a real vacation. Um, but yeah, we are back. We're going to be chatting about Clearview AI, that facial recognition company with, that we talked about like over 100 episodes ago. So wow. yeah, a lot, lot of stuff about them at all. Nothing sketchy. And there's also some news to catch up on. Uh, Sherlyn is taking a break, too, so that's why she's not around. But we'll all be back next week for sure. Thank you all for joining us. So Buddy305Love says, congrats on the new toy, lol. <laughs> Let me tell you, this is a work purchase. If the IRS asks, this yeah. is for you know, work. I'm taking it off on my for taxes. 100% used for business purposes. All those Apple arcade games are for work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I work for a tech website and you never know what mm -hmm. you might end up reviewing. You should play some of those um, games though. They, they will run pretty well on that computer. Yeah, true, true. Mm -hmm. Like Apple Arcade, uh, I do get a few months free. So mm -hmm. I can do and that. some uh, some Steam games will work too. I think uh, Discord, yeah. I think Disco Elysium works on Mac. So check out the Steam games that work too. Yeah, I already have Disco Elysium on Switch. Yeah, I'm waiting well, for yeah. like a long train trip or something mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. game is basically a novel. But basically let's take a novel. step. Yeah, let's take a step back and uh, just like shout out to Buddy Three Hundred Five Love for a second because <laughs> uh, like they always give really great comments yes i think that we like thank you toss a lot of love in the direction of uh that funny name uh poop twice a day or <laughs> mark dell our chat hero but no buddy 305 love thank you for sticking around and thank you for always like putting in really substantial feedback i, I love that helpful it's helpful it's what i love about the too. internet Good vibes. All right, let's get going. Uh, Nate will have to leave shortly after 11, so we're just going to go straight through this episode. Um, okay. Probably won't have time for a QA and a in the middle of the episode, but maybe we, we could do some stuff at the end, and if Nate has to go, Nate will go. It's all good. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's It's not uh, a hard sync. stop or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that everybody is recording. Is everybody recording? I'm recording. The mic looks good. Hopefully okay. no audio Nate? issues today. Yeah. I am recording. Mic looks good. Wunderbar. Okay, let's count down from three. At the end of three, we're all going to make a sound. Uh, then we're going to be quiet for just yep. like three or four seconds. Uh, so chat, if you want to clap along with us, clap at the count of three. Three, two, one. Shit. <laughs> okay, quiet over. Quite over. All right. I'm going to go right into the episode. If you guys are new here, we are going to be recording the audio episode, so we usually can't respond to comments. But uh, yeah, we'll leave room for Q&A at the end, okay? All right. Let's go. <clears throat> What's up, Internet? And welcome back to the Engadget Podcast. I'm Senior Editor Devendra Hardwar. Joining me today is our Deputy Editor, Nathan Ingram. Hey, Nate. How's it going? Hey, Devendra. It is going quite well. How are you this week? 
doing well. Um, actually, not much happening in the tech world. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we wanted to take a step back and talk about something that we, over 100 episodes ago, I think it was episode 16, we talked about Clearview AI, that uh, notorious facial recognition company. So we're going to spend a little time this episode diving back into that. Uh, just so you guys know, Sherlyn is out on vacation. Like, she needs a rest. So hopefully her. Sherlyn will be back next week. Yes. As always, if you're enjoying the Engadget podcast, please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a review on iTunes or anywhere, really. That's always super helpful. And, uh, you know, join us Thursdays, 10 a.m. Eastern, typically for a live stream. You can join our chat. Sometimes we do Q&As and show off gadgets. So it's always a fun time. Come join us. So, Nate, I really want to talk about Clearview AI because there have been... A few, like a lot of stories going around about um, how so many regulators, so many countries and governments are really pushing back on what they're doing. And to recap, Clearview AI, um, about two years ago, it became known as this controversial facial recognition company that was known for scraping images off the web and social media. Um, they basically made this really powerful image database that it turns out cops were using to just like throw an image on there and it would cycle through all those faces and try to find a specific person. Um, just most recently, uh, in February, they claimed that they're expanding um, you know, their overall systems, and their database now has over 100 billion images in their quota. It's called the Index of Faces. That's the dystopian world we're living in. Um, this company, like, they had a lot of controversy and a lot of criticism against them when they uh, first became public, but they're still going. Like, nothing has stopped, um, except we have seen some some recent news that we want to talk about. But Nate, first off, uh, wh what are your thoughts on Clearview? Like, what they were doing, and uh, are you surprised that they're still like going strong? Apparently. I'm a little surprised that they're still going strong, but catching up on the news from this month, um, it seems like they really like, at least in the U.S., well, in the U.S. and the U.K., both hit them with pretty restrictive, uh, you know, measures that I think will hopefully see, you know, expanded on. Um, I think mm -hmm. it's interesting because, right, like they're just pulling public data, which I understand, like we all put our stuff on Facebook and don't yeah. make it private. Like it's out there. Like what do we think is going to happen to it? But it shouldn't necessarily be up to the consumer to like have to safeguard their stuff to that extent. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. like the fact that yeah, law enforcement gets involved with it makes it even sketchier. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the theme of this episode is like the wild, wild west of data. Cause we're going to talk about another story yeah. later on that kind of ties into that. But yeah, here's what is happening now. Um, most recently uh, this week, I believe a UK data protection watchdog group find them 7.55 million pounds, uh, like $9.5 million. Nine, yeah for illegally scraping faces of UK residents on social media and the web. Originally, when we reported the story um, late last fall, they were aiming for like over $21 million in fines. So that, that is the thing they're facing. Um, in March, Italy fined them 20 million euros uh, for very similar things. And uh, most recently, earlier in May, the ACLU won a case against Clearview, uh, preventing them from selling their database to most companies. Um, and specifically, too, they said they would also stop offering free trial accounts to police officers uh, without, you know, the approval of their bosses. That was like the big thing because, um, you know, officers were using Clearview's technology like a search engine, which I, without like the need to go to a judge and get a warrant or like go through any, any traditional processes, like that was a really creepy thing for a lot of people. All that is kind of coming to an, to an end, basically. They can't really sell their database to anybody in America right now, except for you know a couple organizations. Um, so yeah, they're kind of on the rips is how I'd like to see it. But Nate, like, is this enough? Like, How are you seeing what this company is doing? Um, do you think it's going to get any better for them? Should it? No, I think this is a good, um, like between the ACLU decision and the UK, um, what, I, what I think you didn't mention about the UK is that in addition to the fine, which like the fine to me is secondary to the fact that they're required to delete all of their data in the UK. That's pretty mm -hmm. huge to me. Like a whole yeah. country saying like, no, like this has to go, um, could have like a big impact on their business if more countries follow suit, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the decision with the ACLU in Illinois earlier this month, also a pretty big deal because, as you said, they cannot uh, sell their data. I believe it is still accessible by federal law enforcement, Yeah, I want to say, but uh, it's, it's significantly restricted compared to how it was a month ago. So those are two pretty big deals, if you ask me. Um, and 
you know, given the other things you mentioned, right, there was like the Italy fine and there's just so much heat on them now that it's hard to imagine they'll be able to just continue uh, operating as normal, but it is kind of surprising that they've able, they've been able to get as far as they have. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you said, they've been doing this for years. uh, And just now it seems like there's finally some coalescing around the idea that, yeah, we need to limit this or, you know, stop it entirely. There's a good quote from Nathan Fried Wessler, the deputy director of the ACLU speech privacy and technology project. Um, when the Illinois uh, ruling came down, he said by requiring Clearview to comply with Illinois path breaking biometric privacy law, Uh, Not just in the state, but across the country, the settlement demonstrates that strong privacy laws can provide real protections against abuse. He goes on to say Clearview can no longer treat people's unique biometric identifiers as an unrestricted source of profit. Um, Other companies would be wise to take note, and other states should follow Illinois' lead in enacting strong biometric privacy laws. And that's really the key, because uh, Illinois is one of the first states to really take biometrics seriously. I feel like other states will need to do this and will need to, you know, do this on a federal level too. Um, But I I feel like Clearview is coming in at a time where um, all these companies and a lot of startups basically had free reign with our data, right? Like Facebook, um, pretty much every social network like has risen in power um, because so many things. Facial recognition thing. They Mm -hmm. had one going too, right? They had one. I I think they, they paused, they had something on ring and I believe they stopped doing that because of widespread protests, but basically like scraping data, um, that was already on the web, doing all sorts of things with it. Like that was kind of the key to so many of these companies. Clearview, I feel like, has pushed things too far. And now that more and more governments and regulators are like aware of what's happening and are worried about the potential for, uh, you know, for privacy abuse with facial recognition, it it is fascinating to see people genuinely pushing back against Clearview. Um, yeah, it is. It, it sure is something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that. It's just interesting to me how long it takes to sort of catch up with this stuff. Like companies can kind of get a few years head start, right? And just kind of do whatever they want. And then mm-hmm. uh, we figure it out. And, uh, you know, I think that's that's sort of problematic. But also there's just thing in, in the last decade, the amount of data going around and being shared and being produced has like increased so dramatically that I think nobody was prepared for it really. Mm-hmm. And that's why we end up in so many different situations like this where the common thread is like, oh, somebody is doing something weird with like personal data that wasn't thought about five years ago or 10 years ago whenever the platform or service or whatever started started doing what it's doing. Mm-hmm. Other countries that have four settlements on uh, Clearview include uh, Australia, Canada, um, France, and Germany too. Like all uh, the European countries especially have been very uh, strong when it comes to data privacy. Um, so it is, you know, th- this pushback is just kind of good to see because I feel like for a long time, people weren't taking the the issues of privacy issues around facial recognition seriously. Um, we don't have any statements. I don't, I have not found any statements of Clearview, like really um, responding to like all of this pushback right now. Um, but it is interesting to see, like, I do wonder how long they'll be able to keep going um, at this current rate, even though they say they're going to get a hundred billion images in their index of faces um if every if if more and more companies are pushing back um how useful is that database going to be you know yeah i mean and i have to give props also to uh to illinois for Mm -hmm. having the foresight so this this uh be the illinois biometric information privacy act passed in 2008 so like before all this became a thing really like i was saying like it feels like the the sort of information hoovering has become the hallmark of the last decade but uh yeah they got out ahead of that and the fact that their law made it so that they can um limit the sale of it not just in illinois but across the u.s is really Mm -hmm. interesting as well like i think that's um impressive legislating i would say yep It, it is funny to see like regulators actually Understand, understand specifically what the problem is around uh, data privacy. I feel like it was only five, 10 years ago, it was maybe the academics who were really mm-hmm. focusing on this. So uh, in the UK, their information commissioner, John Edwards said, uh, the company not only enables identification of those people, UK residents, he's saying, but effectively monitors their behavior and offers it as a commercial service. And I do feel like that is a big thing too, because um, if uh, Clearview is scraping social media data and it puts somebody both targets a person's face and puts them in like a situation where it's like, oh yeah, somebody at, at that location could certainly do a crime at some point, um, at least all sorts of judgments that we're not quite sure about. 
Um, so yeah, we will be keeping an eye on Clearview AI, but yeah, I, th I think it was good to do a recap like this, you know? Yeah, this UK ruling is like a pretty a pretty mm -hmm. significant one as well. And I think it's just good to see how strongly they were about, you know, when they say the company not only enables identification, but effectively monitors their behavior and offers it as a commercial service. That commercial aspect is really, I mean, it's not great whether it's for law enforcement or for commercial purposes, but the mm -hmm. idea of like selling your face data, like, yeah, that's just creepy as hell. I'm like, I don't want to see a company making money off of the fact that it like is really good at scraping the internet for like yep. individuals. <laughs> Uh, one good link, uh, one good note that I see from our podcast producer, Ben Elman, um, he also points out in Illinois, Facebook recently settled in a class uh, a class action suit, and some Illinois Facebook users are getting like close to 400 bucks because of this to uh, $397 in checks. Um, not, not to say that uh, this stuff pays off, but uh, it is interesting to see these companies have to pony up, and I, I just appreciate seeing governments actually force them to... To do this so buddy 305 love in the chat room says isn't it public domain when your picture is online what's the logic behind not being behind it not being public domain and i've, I've heard some good answers to this uh nate do you have any like thoughts before we get into it yeah and i would say you know i am not a lawyer so yeah. this is just my sort of conjecture but i think that right technically what they're doing they're not it's not illegal for them to gather this data mm -hmm. but i think the question is whether it's sort of like being used in a responsible fashion right like to and also like is it okay to like make money off of it essentially mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah. But there are certain questions too and it's like it's not just images that are randomly around the web like it is stuff from facebook um it was stuff from google when google had social networks and a whole bunch of companies have basically banned uh clearview from scraping their databases and doing that specifically even if the information is out there and publicly, like a lot of companies do have issues with you pulling their data. Um, it is, uh, you know, it, it is sort of a tough thing. It's like, um, who, who owns the data? And you know what? I feel like that's going to be important in our next story. Nate, any, any thoughts you have around uh, Clearview at this point? Or what, what is your main worry about facial recognition? Because we're also seeing, um, for, for me, it's law enforcement. Um, for me, it's like what they'll do with CCD, CCTV cameras, which are in most major cities at this point. Um, but I feel like things could get worse too. Like, have you thought about this potential issue? I mean, I think every time I hear about facial recognition being used in the context of law enforcement, it's almost always getting it wrong. And like, mm -hmm. I don't have a link right on hand, but I feel like there's been enough controversy around like a police department or a law enforcement department uses information to try and identify somebody and they get it wrong. Yep. And, and we know like algorithmically, a lot of these things that they use to search uh, tend to misidentify people of color because they don't have enough samples. And uh, that leads to, you know, false accusations too. Um, I think about like the value of public domain data too. Like a lot of things these companies have done have, have not been so great. Um, I think about like when Facebook started and kind of uh, the things they did to kind of crush other, other social networks. When yep. Uber started, uh, they used tactics to basically uh, wipe out the competition too. Like it is, it, it, there are some things that these companies have done that aren't technically illegal, but like morally, if we think about it, um, I, I think there are a lot of issues that we, we can bring up. So yeah, that's I it for Clearview AI right now, but what's up Nate? I was going to say, I found a couple stories from 2020 yep. uh, about f two false facial recognition arrests in Detroit mm -hmm. uh, with the ACLU filing cases around them. Uh, one In one case, uh, somebody was detained for 30 hours for a crime that he didn't commit mm -hmm. uh, based on false facial recognition data. So that's not cool. That's not cool. I mean, I, I worry, I, I'm a tech guy, but I'm worried about the potential of things like facial recognition and the algorithms around them becoming like the new gods for uh, law enforcement where, you know, people aren't, aren't actually doing uh, the, le the legal footwork and requiring too much on the algorithms to kind of make judgments for them. So right. that's my worry there. And we've seen a lot of science fiction around that too, and kind of feels like we're living in that. So anyway, good we're going to keep an eye. Yeah. Good times. We're going to keep an eye on Clearview AI, but let's move on to some other news. And actually I think related to this, uh, the New York Times had a really good story recently called The Era of Borderless Data is Ending. Um, subhead, uh, nations are accelerating efforts to control data produced within their perimeters, disrupting the flow of what has become a kind of digital currency. And this actually does 
tie into Clearview completely because yeah. the UK uh, was basically finding them for using uh, scraping data around UK citizens. Um, and I, I think like some data that, you know, actually began in the UK. For me, um, what like what was your dream of the internet when you first encountered it, Nate? Like for me, it was like, hey, I could talk to anybody. You know, I can build a thing, use a service yeah. from a whole other country. It doesn't matter where you are. The internet is a flat zone where everybody can be connected uh, equally, right? Yeah, it was communication. Um, and I remember using it specifically like around the time I remember had a couple of like high school friends move and mm -hmm. being able to just like easily contact them was like really nice. Um, and just the idea of like that expanding was great. And then just easy access to information, whatever it happens to be. Like, I remember just like reading about bands that I liked a lot and finding out when they were going on tour and like watching really crappy videos that, you know, came out from the shows. And this is like in 1997 or so. And mm -hmm. they were really bad videos, but uh, just being able to like keep up with stuff in real time and like also find a community around it was the stuff that like got me started on the internet for sure. Most, most definitely. Like I remember I was in like anime chat rooms early on and I had friends from like Canada, Singapore, like all over the world. And we were just like kind of all in the same space. Yep. Um, some things the New York Times points out in Washington, uh, the Biden administration is, you know, pushing an early draft of an executive order to stop China and other companies from gaining access to U.S. data, uh, data from American users. You know, uh, in India, lawmakers are moving to pass a law that would limit data uh, that could leave the nation. That's a nation of 1.4 billion people. So a lot more countries are thinking about like the stuff that is produced within their borders and how they're accessed. I feel like China has been doing this for a while too, right? right. The, the whole thing about China is that, you know, the Great Firewall kind of keeps a lot of things in and only lets certain information from the outside in too. And it feels like we're all kind of going to be dealing with that to a certain degree. Um, is this a good thing? Is this a bad well, thing? Or is this inevitable? Like, what do you think? So the, the China, to, to, Piggyback on the China bit you mentioned, I, my impression was always more about keeping information out of the country rather than, mm -hmm. uh, you know, limiting where information goes from there. Uh, at least that was my like, that's how I mm -hmm. thought about it. Obviously, initially, it both, yeah, it works mm -hmm. both ways. But um, the only like the thing I want to know more about in this uh, New York Times article is data is such a broad term. I want to know a little more about Anything. what. Mm -hmm. right but like <laughs> that that's almost like too big to wrap my head around yeah you it's, know it's like, anything it is a credit card transaction it's an image you upload right it is you know where da you know, data around purchases you make too um pretty much anything like where we're right now um you know i'm talking to you is Nate. Why, yeah let's say that i like mm -hmm. buy something on apple.com yeah like well, why does that information need to go anywhere but between me and Apple and like whatever they use to process payments? Mm -hmm. Well, that's is, it. Is it. Who's who's processing your payments? Right. You know, is it uh, is it Stripe? Is it something mm -hmm. else? Do they have their own payment processor? Like there are right. so many layers of all of our connections. I'm talking yeah. to you over Hangouts, Nate, yeah. and Google Hangouts. Like where is the server that is actually powering this Hangouts conversation? Right. Um, a lot of countries are looking at things like that, like cloud computing. They're aiming to get Google and other companies to build more data centers like in their borders. Right. So information isn't leaving. And I think that that ultimately could help these countries too, to a certain degree in terms of like local businesses and stuff. Um, I feel like that's how they're aiming at it, but it really can be anything like data protection. GDPR is a whole part of mm -hmm. this too. The entire internet has kind of reshaped itself because, uh, you know, the EU has decided to add some strict privacy restrictions. And yep. now we all see it too across the world. Um, it has broader right. impacts. Yeah. Right. I'm thinking about your point about being on Hangouts, right? Like the thing that I think like maybe like people who aren't as closely following technology as we are might be like, you forget that like, it has to go somewhere. There's a physical yeah. location where data has to pass through to get between, you know, me and you or me and Apple or whoever it is. Right. So it's going somewhere. Like you said, it could be going to a server in some other countries mm -hmm. and then it's, it's there and like who else can get it then. Right. Like that stuff is really, yeah. yeah. I feel like that was a lot of the initial concern around TikTok too, because mm. TikTok, you know, was owned by a giant, uh, Chinese company and like what data yep. does TikTok have? Um, I think the whole Trump administration thing against TikTok was like a big joke, but right. there are legitimate concerns to ask about like how these country these companies, especially ones coming from far more restrictive and uh, you know countries that are doing troubling things to their citizens, like what what 
where is that information going? What is it powering, right? Is TikTok's use in America uh, powering like, um, you know, more algorithmic stuff in China and stuff that can, Right. Is, know, there, is, is, there, there. is there a clear view of China scraping all this data and like making facial recognition, for example? Yep. We don't know. There's a lot we yeah. don't know. So yeah. I think this is really interesting to talk about. Uh, ben, our podcast producer, points out, uh, he asked a question, does ending the third party cookie also factor in here? Um, like the that is something browsers are doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, Bing, uh, Chrome, everything, not Bing, Edge, Chrome, mm -hmm. everything has been trying to uh, stop the third-party cookie thing, which was a way for advertisers to track your movements basically across the entire web. Uh, another bit of like unrestricted data that I think right. uh, became a part of the internet um, has essentially made entire companies possible. Like Google is an advertising company, don't forget. And third-party yeah. cookies, things like that are things they've relied on. Now a lot of these companies are pushing back more and um, you know, kind of restricting the power that advertisers have. They're trying to push companies to use like less identifiable ways to uh, you know locate audiences. Uh, do you have deep thoughts about that, Nate? Because I also know you're a Chromebook fan, and I feel like <laughs> Chromebooks especially have kind of like the reason they're so cheap too is uh, in in some sense is that Google makes money from people just being on Google and doing Google right. stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, and that's like always been the trade off, like that we've been thinking about with Google very broadly, right? Is like <laughs> how much data they get from you versus I think like, you know, compared to like Apple or Microsoft, who are like much less reliant on personal data for their business. Like you said, mm -hmm. Google's an advertising company. Uh, I believe that probably 80% of their revenue, I'm just roughly, it, it comes from advertising. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, I think for Apple and Microsoft, it's significantly less or even. Not uh so yeah like they obviously have a vested interest in like knowing what we're doing online mm -hmm. um but yeah i think that like the the for me it's like transparency around this stuff is is extremely helpful but the problem is is like we we're talking about with clearview the data itself is so complicated and so multifaceted and there's so much of it that it's almost impossible to explain i think to a normal person where it's going and like that doesn't mean it's okay mm -hmm. but you know, like you said, like a lot of these businesses have kind of come up and been developed. And now we're sort of starting to say, wait a second, is this okay? Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do you put this genie back in the bottle? And that I'm not sure. Like, yeah. I know there's a way to do it, but it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of regulation and basically companies forcing themselves to to do better, I guess. And uh, yeah. speaking of like browser tracking, like DuckDuckGo was in the mm -hmm. news because uh, it turns out like their company known for their browser uh, and search engine, uh, that's all about privacy, right? They're not they're not doing trackers from Google and other places. Turns out DuckDuckGo was allowing Microsoft browsing trackers um, because uh, it was part of like a marketing deal that they had made, uh, an agreement in their syndicated search content contract, basically. So DuckDuckGo, supposed to be fully secure, not tracking, tracking you in any way, turns out what was kind of, you know, letting Microsoft trackers do their thing um do you are you a duck duck go fan nate like did did you have I mean, a feeling about this i like it uh theoretically but this yeah i i don't so i'm, I'm just catching up on the story now mm -hmm. so forgive me mm -hmm. but um yeah the idea that this company makes their whole stance about you know security and privacy and then it's like oh well but we also had this little marketing deal or whatever in the background and that, that's I just it. don't know how that's you how store those things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Then you you get you get hooked on the revenue, and you mm -hmm. do more of it, and you do more of it, and then you're Google. <laughs> yeah. So the um, CEO and yeah. founder uh, Gabriel mm -hmm. Weinberg uh, basically was like on Twitter talking about this and like admitting mm -hmm. to it. Uh, he points out that it's only with the the web browser, not the DuckDuckGo search engine. Um, he's also said like they're trying to uh, come to an agreement with Microsoft where they don't have to do this while also keeping their deal. But I feel like right. just the fact that this happened and they weren't transparent about it. And uh, this is like a reputation harming thing. Maybe that maybe DuckDuckGo can come back from this. Yeah. You know? Well, and again, for me, it kind of comes back to transparency, right? Like if DuckDuckGo said, hey, we have a browser. Here's what it does. Here's why it's better than, you know, Chrome, Safari, Edge. Here's the trade off. Mm hmm we're a business we need to have revenue somehow to be able to operate and this is where we're getting some of our revenue you can at least then make the decision well okay 
is this a lesser of two evils thing or whatever but yeah just kind of like pushing it through and then having it actually come out as a bad look that's rough um, they will... that, they've been vocal on like twitter like they call out oh, yeah. google and everybody like uh one post from like may 11 duck duck uh, duck duck go tweets uh their new chrome extension now blocks google's new tracking method topics and new ad retargeting method fledge these are both ways to uh, get get around the third party cookie uh you know stepping away from yeah. that uh duck duck go says google says they're better for privacy but the simple fact is tracking is tracking no matter what you call it uh basically i don't think that the go has much of a moral high ground anymore for calling out these companies right uh i think it's good i mean like i think that when i think of DuckDuckGo, obviously i think the search engine comes from for the browser the browser is more of a new initiative i believe mm -hmm. uh so it's it's probably less impactful that they got called out in this way but it makes you start to wonder okay it's so like well what exactly is going on in your search let's you know is it is it private but also we had a uh deal with whoever and like okay well we give we just gave them that data or like it followed you around this way um yeah it's it's tricky it's tricky uh like the new york times like points out too i think one reason normal people don't understand like what we're talking about when we're talking about like data just being free reign everywhere and people actually caring about this stuff uh, i think about like when we talk about the edward snowden stuff and how a lot of normal people just don't don't realize off of you, yeah. what was happening and how governments were using metadata to essentially like uh, track what people are doing and learn things about them. So I feel like, I don't know, we, we need more education of data on like a civic level at this point, but with the world being on fire, I guess that is kind of tough. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's slightly less of a priority probably. <laughs> um, and again, like we've been, we've said a few times, like there's just so much, like, I don't know how you untangle that and make it understand it, it's sort of like uh the problem with like the end user licensing agreements that you sign mm -hmm. when you have a new hardware or start up a new software like there's so many you, you you know there's 64 pages of terms that you're agreeing to no human being can understand it yeah. but you need to use your computer so you agree to it and uh, it's the same thing it, yeah. like, how do you how do you make that into something digestible by an average person not a security and i feel expert, like that that a, should be the yeah. goal like, honestly, mm -hmm. that is why I got into tech stuff is because I saw people like Leo Laporte and other like tech media guys, like just trying to break down this stuff so normal people could understand it. And I feel like a lot of this pushback has led to better alerts, right, from yep. uh, Google and other services, like in terms of like, okay, this app is going to do this, this, and this. Um, Apple's whole push now to stop apps from even tracking things. Like once they start, you know, once you launch an app and yeah. app your ios device will ask you hey do you want this thing to be doing yeah. any tracking that sort of awareness i think is very clear and yeah. is a result of people just pushing back on a lot of this stuff so we're going to be keeping an eye on this i know data is not the most exciting thing in the world but <laughs> everything is data you, you yep. should be thinking about this and what your data does and who is using it and who's profiting off of your data i do hope a lot of this could end up being things where it's like the the dream of nfts right like your thing <laughs> should be able to make money for you um or you sell access to certain things and you know profit from that too so i maybe it could lead to something like that um not quite sure yeah let's move on to another story uh real quick amd is teasing their new ryzen 7000 desktop chips which are coming this fall with five nanometer zen 4 cores these are going to be the first uh desktop chips with five nanometer uh cores basically really really fine production here um we're it, it is funny to see amd getting to this level like there weren't um ryzen 6000 desktop chips which launched in laptops earlier this year uh desktops have basically been on the 5000 line for a while uh they're saying these new chips uh are going to be more efficient more powerful of course around 15 percent better in single threaded benchmarks um but also they're going to have things like ddr5 and pcie 5.0 built in from the beginning uh, they're going to have support for very, very hot chips, too, like uh, things up to, what is it here? Um, a very, very high wattage, like I believe close to 200. Um, they're going to be ready for like much faster and hotter chips. I just like seeing this uh, this spec war between AMD and Intel uh, because Intel's last chips, Nate, I don't know if you've been like following the benchmarks, but those 12 down chips which have a hybrid kind of setup, right? They have powerful mm. cores and efficient cores. Those have ended up being really, really great for Intel. Like yep. they're great in laptops, they're great in desktops, great multi-threading performance. Um, adding more overall cores to a chip than AMD was. Um, AMD is not doing that. They're still doing like 
every core is a powerful core. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think like, oh man, I love seeing this fight. I just love seeing it. Um, yeah, yeah, there's there. I've rarely come across a more Devendra story, so I'm I'm glad that you got to talk about this one it's today. A good fight. Uh, yeah, do you, no, like, so do, you, think... do you have a desktop anymore, Nate? Like, do no, you care about how these uh, things are going? Yeah, I do in the sense that I really like the competition, right? Like, I think like you just mentioned, like seeing. I think for a while, AMD was kind of a second class citizen for, in the for a while. Chip yeah, loop for a good while. Yeah, mm -hmm. and now it feels like they're really uh, competing again, and it feels like they took advantage of Intel having some like. Mm -hmm. you know slowdowns right and so i think yeah more options is better i mm -hmm. think that what you mentioned about intel and the hybrid model right seems to make a lot of sense and i feel like that's kind of what apple is doing with the m1 series right and uh and their a series like they've got the efficiency stuff and then the high performance stuff and yeah uh, and those are all mobile seems... chips too so they're like mm -hmm. even more um efficiency oriented right than desktop right. chip yeah right uh something you'll like nate uh amd yeah. announced some new mendocino cpus which will likely be headed to chromebooks later this year too um <laughs> but like for in systems price between three at three ninety nine and six ninety nine mm -hmm. with uh likely four let me see here four cores mm -hmm. um uh, yeah not not a high core count but likely including RDNA two graphics so to have you know a Chromebook that could do uh decent graphics stuff or even like a cheap Windows laptop I also like to see uh, AMD kind of focusing on this too. Well, I like now the, that I like cheap hardware. Yeah, I would say now that uh, Steam oh, Steam is running on Chromebooks, <laughs> give it a little more graphics power. I, you know, I think last time I was on, I'm going to talk about how I was uh, I was playing around with that, and I, mm -hmm. uh, it was a good time because obviously uh, the hardware I was running on was pretty modest, um, but from a graphics perspective anyway, but mm -hmm. I could run a bunch of, you know, pretty new games. Uh, but obviously, you know, it's no different than running, like trying to run like God of War on a Windows laptop that doesn't have a dedicated graphics processor. It was just a total slideshow. Like, yeah. I, but I had to do it just because I could. Uh, uh, did but you write was, that up? Totally I forget. I forget I did. if you did hands on with that. Okay. Yeah, what is that story totally... called? Mm -hmm. uh, let me find it. It's, we'll it's check that something... out. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I am fascinated to see Steam kind of go that route too, because Chromebooks... Yeah are supposedly only had like it's a linux uh os you know they're only supposed right. to run web browsers yeah yeah but um there's some there's a lot of this a lot of i think like at least valve's steam games mm -hmm. work on linux right so you can run mm -hmm. those like mm -hmm. natively um and then yeah there's like compatibility tools to run everything else um what did i try i tried cuphead i tried hades fallout mm -hmm. 4 so you know not like new stuff um i tried witcher 3 wild hunt and it all worked better than i expected um you know not perhaps optimal in some cases but like hades was great and like i'm like yeah. okay cool i can play that now oh yeah your, um, your story is called steam on a chromebook works better than i expected so hey yeah. pretty good yeah. pretty good i mean it yeah. is fascinating to see uh steam games on chromebooks but also uh some on max too like a, i'm su still surprised a lot of developers don't prioritize max support so i don't know maybe a thing we'll see especially with smaller indie games um one final story which i think is the most hilarious thing i've read this week Somebody stole Seth Green's Bored Ape, and it was supposed to star in his new show, and his show doesn't have a star. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. This is NFT in a nutshell, right? Just yeah. total, total nonsense. There, um, there's a story in BuzzFeed, by the way, by Sarah Emerson, just to frame this. He was robbed of several NFTs uh, this month after succumbing to a phishing scam, and we hear this so much um and yeah he was planning an animated series around these these nfts and i feel like there are many levels of stupid right here but also i don't i don't know if that would have worked out what do you like what are your thoughts your first thoughts thoughts hearing this name my first thought is that it's ridiculous <laughs> it's just total nonsense and it's stupid amounts of money being thrown around for stuff that doesn't really exist mm -hmm. but going beyond that i think the notion that um you know this this thing was stolen and thus he no longer has the rights to use it i don't know mm -hmm. how legally sound that is because probably not but right he doesn't because, have access to the thing anymore so right he doesn't have access to the thing oh, but yeah. you know he's still you know he, it, it's illegal like if it was stolen then how can like he not have the rights to it anymore i mean it, it's that's true. very that's it's true. very weird it is funny uh, to see a lot of like crypto bros yeah. being like um uh you, you mean the the blockchain the ledger is not law what right. you mean the world does not it is not ruled by this algorithmic uh, thing that I have uh, spent so much money on. Uh, Seth Green did show a trailer for this show, which basically shows like 
cut out animated board apes like walking around in real life you know cities and stuff um yeah no. <laughs> i mean i'm sorry for for seth green that his his ape was stolen because of a phishing attack but mm-hmm. i think that just reinforces the fact that we all need better security hygiene on the internet people mm-hmm. shouldn't uh, be letting your board apes out of your uh out of your out of your site don't like let them that. out of your site uh, watch what you click people uh buzzfeed uh writes unfortunately for green what also matters is copyright law and when the actor's nft collection was pilfered by a scammer he lost the commercial rights to his show's cartoon protagonist so i think that is kind of the thing the crux um, of the issue yeah um just amazing just but again amazing. this is like such a new a new thing right like there's there's it hasn't been tested in court right like i said buzzfeed writes mm-hmm. that uh nft copyright law is like this total wild west right so we don't know obviously. it's all nope. wild west but you know what go back and listen to our episode last week about the crypto crash mm-hmm. because uh, this is all kind of related this is not like a market crash thing this is like a user error thing but turns out you have no protections at all it's like losing bitcoin like that nobody's gonna help you man that's right. not it's not federally backed uh if you lost it in a hard it's not drive somewhere, fdic insured yeah you're just uh you're just done so yeah. anyway let us know what you guys think about seth green's board ape nft would you like to see an nft tv show you know or something something around nfts uh, is this gonna be the future of content i sure hope not yeah Let's move on to what we're working on. Nate, like, hey, uh, hey, I hold know. Hold on, hold on. Yep. Okay, hold on. so um, let's uh, do a little bit of a better button on mm-hmm, mm-hmm. an end for that other news. So just. Sure. Give me some thoughts, Ben. Okay, what's, what are you what asking for? Um, I'm saying uh, mm-hmm. something something better than, like, nf i don't know uh, maybe it's just that the entire yeah. that i thought the entire segment was silly it is silly it's, it's it all very silly. silly it's all very yeah. silly let me let me let me think of a thing uh to say um yeah okay i think a new phrase we need to come up with is uh r.i.p nft how about that like you lose your nft you're just done sorry seth green i i, I hope you can recover from losing your nfts okay yeah a let's move better. on Thank you. okay Let's move on to what we're working on. Nate, let's go to you first, actually, because I've been talking for a while. Uh, what, yeah. what are you working on? What are you reviewing? I am reviewing the Sonos Ray speaker, which uh, I got to check out in New York City at the beginning of May. Uh, I can't say much more about it uh, in terms of the review, but it'll be out soon. Um, and so we quick catch up. I think I came on to talk about this, in fact, but it's a $279 soundbar from Sonos, mm-hmm. by far the cheapest uh, home theater product they've made yet. Uh, it's not cheap. Obviously, there's a lot of cheaper sound bars out there, but I think that at the price point, you're going to get a really nice sounding device for yeah. smaller rooms or smaller TVs. What, what uh, are without... you watching to test that, Nate? I watched, uh, I always go to, um, I mean, I watched lots of TV lately. We'll get into mm-hmm. the picks lately, but I've been watching Homeland, uh, speaking of the CIA, mm-hmm. and I've been watching uh, The Staircase, and I put some movies on there. Obviously, I go for fellowship of the ring to get the nice like clear dialogue from the the like intro sure, combined yeah. with the like battle sounds that come right in a few minutes in so like that's a nice test of it um uh pacific rim another good another good just like stupid action movie to get some like really good like big sounds out of the thing uh and then yeah just whatever random nonsense i watch you know sitcoms and stuff but cool. uh, and then trying some music on it and yeah it's, it's it sounds good um does it sound like better to you than other like soundbars in that price range i know there are a lot of videos and things like that's my real question you know, yeah are they are they doing something new here at that price uh hard to say mm-hmm. hard to say you have to do uh, some think, back like yeah back and forth i think, testing I think with right guys, i think that it, it it's 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 basically like the way the sonos roam the portable one for 180 dollars is like a good like gateway mm-hmm. drug if you never bought a sonos speaker before yeah you I get love like, mine. yeah right you get a good experience for that and then you say oh i can expand this like i can I can get bigger speakers and have multi-room setup. Or mm-hmm. in the case of the the Ray, if you like the Ray, you can add you know rear surrounds to it, and then maybe eventually replace the Ray with a beam or an arc, and like kind of like slowly upgrade your system over time. Mm-hmm. So it's like I think the benefits of the Sonos ecosystem, combined with their like unwavering kind of quality sound design, is the is is the thing that sells us. That doesn't mean mm-hmm. it's better necessarily than like what Vizio is doing, but. Uh, I think it's 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 still a compelling package yeah. based on you know what I heard. 
I think a lot of people have to think about like, what, what are you going to do with sound in your house? Right. It's not mm-hmm. just about the sound bar. It's like, do you want something in the kitchen? Do you want something right. like, do you have an outdoor space? Do you occasionally want to bring something out there? Do you, you could just get a Bluetooth speaker, but yep. wouldn't it be nice if you were having a house party for everything to be synchronized? Yeah. And that is basically why I ended up getting the Roam myself. Although I'm really mm-hmm. tempted by the move. Um, yeah, we, we have criticized Sonos uh, for the way they've kind of killed some earlier products because that is the fate of every connected product, but yep. um, hopefully they're going to keep these things around for much longer. I think they notice like people don't want to buy something and then you know five ten years later uh, yeah. have a you know a big piece of the functionality uh, checked out. Did they respond yeah. to any like did they say anything about longevity for this device or other devices? I mean, so well, here's an interesting one for you. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time, Sonos announced the Ray. They also announced that they're doing their own voice assistant. Yes, which I think yeah. we talked about also. Yeah, and they were specifically they made it very clear that every Sonos speaker that's been made with a microphone. Yep. So that's about five years of speakers supports it. That's so, pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Way they're back going to back the one. to the original yeah. one from 2017, which has since been upgraded internally. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, they're like. Uh, if they're bringing that to their, you know, five-year-old speaker, like that's pretty good. Um, yeah. So yeah. I think that the Ray, like it's, it's a pretty basic device, right? Um, but th- there's nothing that should stop it from working for, you know, years to mm-hmm. come as far as I can mm-hmm. tell. Cool. I'm looking forward to yeah. reading that review, Nate. Uh, real quick, I am still working on the Acer Triton 500 SE review. Uh, this is a, uh, I believe, um, this is a 16 inch notebook that I have as an RTX 3080 Ti. I'm really interested in gaming notebooks that start to look more like just normal computers. Um, yeah. because I do feel like not everybody needs the flash. Not everybody, not everybody needs like the gamer LEDs and stuff. This is one of those devices and it is pretty hot. Like I am pretty nice. hot in a good way. It is really fast. That screen is beautiful. So i um, working on the review. Keep an eye out for that. Let's What's move on to price? our pop What's the yeah. price point? Price point. Ballpark. I'm trying to think here. I think it starts around 1800 and the one I'm reviewing uh, probably is upwards of 2400 2600 mm-hmm. at this point. I have to look at the exact prices. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, you know, you pay more for these things, but at this point you're you're like in razor blade territory too. And I think for the same money you could get a blade 15, uh, you could get something like this with a bigger, uh, bolder screen too. So yeah. Really good nice. time to be in the market for gaming laptops. Uh, good luck finding things in stock. That seems like right. a big issue. Um, but yeah, let's move on to our pop culture picks. Nate, what are you watching? Uh, as I mentioned before, I was talking about the Ray. I have been watching The Staircase on HBO, uh, which is pretty good. I mean, I, I mm-hmm. think I read some mixed reviews of it, but uh, for me, I don't know anything about the doc- the original documentary or and the, the Staircase story. was like this really famous, like basically one of the first true crime stories to get pretty like uh, popular on a cult level like it was a documentary right. before that so you haven't seen that nate no i believe it's on netflix though so i might have to check yeah. it out after this just it's on like... netflix with like some new episodes too apparently yeah yeah so um but that's it was from like the last decade right i think it came out around the time it, of the like case 2005, which is five like way right. yeah that's yeah. when it originally so, started yeah yeah so going into the show not knowing anything about that or the case itself has been you know pretty good i think some people like took issue with how they like like there's been some controversy about like is this dramatic adaptation accurate blah blah blah, mm-hmm, blah. Mm-hmm. i'm not really thinking about that and just trying to enjoy it as a show and in that respect it's extremely tense extremely kind of like creepy uh good stuff the the stars on the screen there uh are excellent it's weird seeing colin colin firth being a bad guy uh essentially <laughs> is he bad i don't know well we don't know i don't yeah. know yet but He's, I think a lot of people, you know, what, like, that, whether that, he that did the crime or not, he yeah. doesn't seem like a very good guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's kind of a, he's kind of a jerk. And uh, it's also interesting hearing his American accent. Um, and then Tony Collette. That's always also. weird. That, yeah. that is weird to me. Uh, I want to shout out Top Gun Maverick. It turns out, guys, <laughs> the sequel to Top Gun is pretty freaking rad. And I don't like Top Gun. This movie rules. Oh. So if you have a chance to see it in theaters, uh, see it on the biggest screen possible, see it in IMAX if you can. Um, it basically does a lot of what Top Gun did, but better because the technology has gotten to the point where you could actually put an IMAX camera in the cockpit and they have certainly Tom Cruise uh, flying these planes, some of these planes, um, but also all the other actors, like just getting footage of them actually reacting to the G-force and you know climbing and everything like it is pretty wild how much of a ride this movie is. Um, so I think it absolutely rules. And I don't even like the original Top Gun. Like I, I was going to say, I you didn't care. hate it. Yeah. yeah. So it's funny. Um, I, uh, 
mm -hmm. a couple of friends and I watched the original. We have like a, a virtual movie night we've been doing throughout the pandemic and mm -hmm. none of us had seen Top Gun. So we put it on and I was like, <laughs> what the hell is the big deal? What, what is happening here? I was like, it the is... stakes were so yeah. low for like most of the movie. I'm like, okay, you're at some sort of flight no training stakes. thing. Whoop de doo No stakes. Um, um, I liked Mark I... Green from ER being in it though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Anthony Michael Hall, like, yeah, yeah. always good to see. Um, you did, the thing about Top Gun, and we just reviewed it on the film cast in one of our After Dark mm. episodes, but it is, it is just like a mood piece, right? It is like, hey, we got guys in fast planes and danger you got zone. cool danger zone. You got cool music. You got Tom Cruise. Um, it is like all about energy and vibes and not so much about the action, to be honest, because they were just mm. shooting like B-roll of, uh, of uh, Navy fighter jets just go, going all over mm -hmm. the place. Um it is like a combination of things and has like defined action movies for the past, like basically ever since Top Gun, a lot of movies have been uh, coasting under very similar vibes. So anyway, I don't like Top Gun. I love Top Gun Maverick. Um, also quickly want to shout out Hacks season two, a show we've talked about when the first season came out. This is a show that, that is fantastic. It's about an aging, like an older comedian who brings in this like younger protege to kind of help her. Um, but I, I love it. It is one I of those shows. Heard... Mm hmm. I was just saying, I think I've heard of it. I just heard about it because it came back. What uh, network is it on? Uh, HBO Max. Okay. Uh, yeah. And it stars Jean Smart, who is amazing in everything. Like she was on, you know, 24. She was on Frasier. She, she is somebody who has been in TV for a while. It's a really good platform for her to be like sharp and funny. Um, but it's also, it's one of those shows where it's like, I can't miss 10 seconds of this. Like it is so sharply written and everything is so funny about it where I, I just need to like drink it in very slowly because the episodes are like half an hour long too. Um, anyway, it's amazing. Check out Hack Season 2 and check out Season 1 if you have not seen it yet. Anything else you want to mention, Nate, or bring up? Yeah, I mean, I think that you've, you've tapped me out on <laughs> <laughs> everything I've got on my mind for today except, uh, well you know, continue surviving in this really weird world that we're living in. Continue surviving. Um, yeah, Thing, things are not great. People, uh, take care of yourselves because yep. everything looks kind of bleak out there. So do what you can. Do what you can to take care of yourselves. Let's wrap for this episode. Our theme music is by game composer Dale North. Our outro music is by our very own managing editor, Terrence O'Brien. The podcast is produced by Ben Elman. You can find me online at, at Devendra on Twitter and at the Filmcast Podcast. Where can people find you, Nate? I'm on Twitter at Nate Ingram. Cool. And email us at podcastandgadget.com. Leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe on anything that gets podcasts. You know, all, all those other platforms. We won't mention a certain streaming music network, but yes, everything. We're out, folks. Got it. Okay. Scoop Super boom. tight. Super tight. Yeah. Well, good. I mean, if we don't do a Q and A in the middle of the episode, uh, it kind of keeps the energy going. Sorry, sorry, yeah. YouTube. Uh, but now we can look at our YouTube channel and see yeah. what's going yes. on. So, Nate, feel free to drop whenever you need to. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'll hang out. For oh a yeah, it's 10:55. Um, so we had one comment from user Elemento. Uh, we were talking went from when we were talking about. Key Clearview mm -hmm. AI. Uh, they said, I don't really find these fines super effective. Yeah, if you not very big. Big companies who sometimes do stuff they shouldn't, they can just get away with it by paying a small portion from their wealth. Mm -hmm. I would not even say a small portion. I would say mm -hmm. a decimal portion. They're, they're not like, a wealth company is the thing. It's not like when Google gets slapped with like a yeah, million dollar fine. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. This is not Google. And also, this led to a more substantive thing than just a fine. Mm -hmm. It, yeah, and, for me, it's less about the fine and more about the like restrictions that, like, yes, you know, yeah. having to delete their whole UK database, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Fine. Yeah. The and fine it, it led to that settlement in the US saying that they can't sell any of their stuff to most uh, organizations. Yeah. That's pretty significant. The fact that they say that they're going to be going in on a like case by case and um, what did they say? Like more consent based business or mm -hmm. something. Um, that means that it will operate a lot more conventionally if it continues to operate at all. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so it would be just like any of those other, you know, uh, sometimes you see in like grocery stores or any other place where they actually have their clock in system, not in like a back room or something. Mm -hmm. So like I've seen kind of like biometric, like hand scanner mm. things that you put a hand in to clock in. That's wild. 
Okay. Also yeah. biometric, but it is much more conventional than, mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. some place that's been scraping data from online and yeah. using it for, you know, really whoever wants to pay for it. Wasn't Amazon testing out like hand hand tracking too to like check out from some of those grocery stores? Some some crazy thing. Yes, too. yes. Yeah. I think that is an Amazon Go mm. thing. Oh no, uh, wait. Isn't the idea it was a of separate Amazon thing. Go? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Because the idea, mm -hmm. I think they might be using that or want to use that at mm -hmm. Whole Foods. And mm -hmm. then the idea of the Amazon Go grocery stores is yep. that you literally can just like pick something Tap off in. the shelf. Because uh You're, have you guys so have you used the grow the go watched. thing? Yeah. Have you used the go thing, Ben? I have I okay. see it in Midtown all the time. I yep. walk yep. past the um the Amazon Go store. Oh yeah, there is one there now. Yeah. Yeah, in Midtown Manhattan all the mm -hmm. time and I will not set foot in there. <laughs> have you I used it, Nate? Like have it. you seen nope. it in action? No, I haven't. It's pretty um, it's pretty wild, but the the thing that is weird is the authentication. Like for a lot of people you have to download a new app you have to sign in and you tap into that as you're going in, right? You tap something. So I feel like that's what they're trying to just deal with. Like they have your fingerprints. You just walk into the store and you don't have to load an app or anything. You know, they so like, you keep going. Relevant to this, like a little over a week ago, we mm -hmm. wrote a story about MasterCard doing a pay with a smile test. Oh God. Uh, oh yeah. God. Don't tell uh, me to do that. They yeah. did. They did uh, confirm that, uh, the facial data is converted to a digital template and encrypted. The face image stays on your device. Uh, it sounds like not entirely unlike Face ID, which seems to be fairly secure. Oh my uh, God. But it just so sounds... Whoever thought of that idea should be sent to prison. You know, like that. <laughs> that is clearly such a brave new, like a dystopian smile for your you know for your overpriced lattes yeah please or yeah. something every every time i hear something about that i just had to look it up um it was a it makes me think of a 4chan post from 2013 mm -hmm. that was predicting a possible 2018 so now it's already antiquated but it is for the people in the know it's the please drink verification can <laughs> uh story Nate, do you know what I'm talking about? No, but I like the... I like oh, the God. Bit. Okay, so l let me just read through it really quickly. It's like, 2018, wake up feeling sick after a late night of playing video games. Excited to play some Halo 2K19. That's not so inaccurate. No. So, so the idea is, I think this was right around when Kinect was uh, being introduced mm -hmm. or something. And so mm -hmm. the idea is that it's more voice controls. So it, they're saying like Xbox on. And yeah. in order to turn on the Xbox, you have to like say the passcode, like Doritos, do it right. Like do <laughs> as in Mountain Dew. Yeah. And then yeah. if you can't verify, you have to drink a can of like <laughs> Mountain Dew. And you have to like, the idea was like, premise of the story was that you have to like verify every couple of hours or something. So it forces you to keep on drinking Mountain <laughs> Dew. And like, if you want to play video games for like four hours, you're going to have to drink at least like maybe four two or three cans yeah or like four cans of mountain dew mm -hmm, it, it's mm -hmm. it's terrible um then actually uh not that long after that i saw somebody was tweeting about a patent that was very similar to that the idea it it, it was a patent for a system where you could skip a commercial by saying the name of the product right right awful hated awful. it i mean we're we're gonna see a lot of people exploring this. The movie pass guy uh want wanted to do like the eye tracking thing too, like tracking oh, your eyes boy. as you're watching the ads. And I feel like I, ooh, I hate that's, that. That stuff that is we've talked about it, but those are things that could lead to future future black mirror scenarios for all of us where you have to to get credit for the ad, maybe the ad will give you a credit like a free movie credit or something. You gotta keep those eyes open. Yeah. You can't, so, can't look away. Yeah. Then not we creepy have... at all. Then we have Declan Flynn also mm -hmm. talking about big data and uh, surveillance, talking about, um, you know, some people will freak out about stuff like Clearview AI or, and other like measures of being tracked online, but they're like, I love my store loyalty card. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, that seems um, uh, like sure. a contradiction of terms. But you're However, agreeing to that. You are asking to do that. You well, know? yes. You can stop at any in. time. <laughs> yeah, you opt in. And mm -hmm. also, I, I heard of a friend told me about this amazing, amazing way to jam um, mm -hmm. uh, loyalty card um, problems, especially if it's 
like one of those terminals where you can put a number in. Right, right, right. Every person in the country has put in 8675309 <laughs> as their loyalty card number. Yes. So like every uh, probably every zip code in America has an 8675309 loyalty card huh. on um on uh on file file for them. Yeah. So if you're at CVS but you never had the CVS loyalty card, just put in Jenny's number from the song and you will be able to get that discount amazing amazing uh the last um bit of banked stuff was uh so buddy 305 love our chat hero for today was talking about how they have two fears in this life one <laughs> is mistaken only identity mm -hmm. yes only two fears one is Pretty mistaken good. identity the second is ghosts and uh then we ended up what if the ghost about... takes your identity man what well i now? mean that's actually a great premise for a movie somebody uh -huh. write that it's been done it's been done yeah but yeah yeah, yeah. but uh then we t started talking about like how data tracks you online and like how that can actually help with cases of mistaken identity mm -hmm. um it reminded me of two jokes by two different comedians mm -hmm. mitch hedberg a white comedian once said like i bought a single donut at a donut store like why are you trying to give me a receipt you know transaction over that's really easy mm -hmm. we don't need and to bring ink and paper into this right yeah right, we right, don't right. need to bring bring ink and paper into this exactly um and the second one is uh i think hannibal burris a black mm -hmm. comedian was referencing mitch's joke from years ago yes saying I remember, yeah um, like I keep my receipts for literally everything just in case I need an alibi for where I was at a certain time. <laughs> what yep. a stark difference. Well, yeah. uh, what, a, what a difference. Uh, boy. RIP Mitch. RIP Mitch. RIP Mitch. Seriously. Yeah. And so Hannibal funny. Burris, I think he was definitely referencing Mitch's joke because yeah. <laughs> Hannibal Burris is a comedy nerd. He has never been anything but a comedian. He started mm -hmm. like doing sets as he was a teenager in Chicago and just like kept on going f with that f his entire Love life, basically. Love his vibe. Yeah. He's a good yeah. dude. <laughs> He's been uh, getting a lot of crap for being a landlord, but. Yeah. other than that love his vibe well, yeah love his vibe i mean a lot of people are landlords unfortunately yeah do, 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 do. I, I see something again from buddy 305 love uh you probably don't need to rewatch top gun if you're gonna go into this movie <laughs> they they oh my god you've okay. seen it once you're good um and they uh, they yeah. recap like what you need to know basically which but. is basically that tom cruise exists oh well, you know there there is uh his best friend died it may yeah. have been his fault yada 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 no spoilers yeah. that that directly uh, impacts this movie but okay so this movie is good last... i'll put that out there yeah last thing um since this is also movie related and and uh you know movie culture related there's that thing from i forget what movie it is but like Quentin Tarantino plays a guy at a party where he's mm -hmm. talking about like the, you know, possible secret, uh, you know, or an alternate interpretation of Top Gun. Uh -huh. where it's like a man's struggle with his sexuality. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I mean, sure. It is. Uh, there's been a lot written about this. Um, uh, Top Gun is hilariously homoerotic in so many ways. So it, 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 it so many, is. So many ways. It, it's, it's funny. So it's just funny. And there's a lot of great actual cultural commentary <laughs> on that. And, it, it is very much a soap opera. I think that's the thing. And guys, like men, don't have many uh, outlets for expressing their feelings toward each other. And Top Gun is entirely about these bros, like, supporting each other and loving each other. And I feel like that's it. That's why a lot of, let's say, appeal sports for a lot of people, too, and knowing the, like, interplay what's happening with your favorite sports star. Um, that's it. It's a soap opera. Top Gun yeah. is a soap opera. It's a romance more than it is an action movie. The NBA Never. is a soap opera. Yeah. It's all soap opera. And I love action movies that kind of dive into that. Like Michael Mann is one of my favorite directors because he, he makes movies and typically action movies about people with interiority, you know, like people with feelings and hopes and dreams and everything. Go watch Heat. Heat is a I haven't soap seen opera. Most, I'm just looking. I'm like, I haven't seen most of his movies. Come on, Nate. Come on. Don't do this to me. Anyway, uh, watch Heat and watch the Heat shootout with your new speaker. And that's going to be, that's a, that is a hell nice. of a workout. 
All right, because, perfect. Yeah, there you go. Pete, amazing movie, everybody. Uh, anything else from the chat room or you guys want to bring up? Uh, at some point, I'll talk about my car drama because I've, I've given up <laughs> on my, my, my nice plug-in hybrid minivan because Chrysler Aww. sucks. American car makers suck. Um, but also because of LG batteries. So they bought LG's batteries have basically betrayed them once again. So it's a whole thing. That's sad. It's very sad. So now I'm like, okay, now I just have to. Are you going to get a new car? I have to trade it in. Yeah. I'm not, it's going to take them a while to fix it. And meanwhile, I don't like the thought of my kids in like a uh, a lithium, potential lithium fire, you know, fireball. Yeah. Battery fires that's aren't a, great, folks. They just like go a, up. You can't, you can't stop it. It's like yeah, a that, load. That uh, yeah. happened to a Tesla not that long ago. I mean, it right? happens to a lot of electric cars. And yes, gasoline fires and engine fires are a thing. Uh, but they they are typically like they take a while to build not up underneath you smoke. also yeah right not underneath you not underneath the child seats um so yeah that, that's gonna be a whole thing all right i think we're done then folks uh thank you nate for keeping us on track kind of <laughs> kind of aim to be tight to get you out you know so you could work on your review i gotta work oh, on I review. appreciate it folks stay tuned you know we're gonna have this audio episode out soon um yeah stay tuned to engadget we've got a lot of fun stuff coming it's gonna be a busy next couple weeks definitely all right okay. thanks folks. thanks for hanging out yep thanks for watching uh the stream comes to you via our radio team uh led by just comprised by um julio barrientos and luke brooks uh, if you stuck around this long, you know we live in a world of algorithms better than the average person. <laughs> Rate us on iTunes. If you watch the stream, download the podcast too. The podcast. Help subscribe to our channel. The whole, Subs all yeah, subscribe to the channel, download the podcast, help us with the numbers, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, folks. <laughs>